Hello, my name is Dr. Mark Allendary. I am the Medical Director of Infectious Diseases and Chief Innovation Officer for Access Health Louisiana. We are the largest Medicaid providing clinic system in Louisiana, and I'm also the co-chair of the ACOI Infectious Diseases Subspecialty Section. Along with the leadership of the ACOI, we want to thank you for all that you're doing as we face this unprecedented time in medicine fighting the COVID-19 virus. Moving forward in conjunction with the ACOI, we want to share with you some information as it becomes available, as well as some of the bright spots we're seeing so that we all can feel some hope in these trying times. So, our first bit of news is that asymptomatic cases are likely more prevalent than first believed. The, f the difficult thing about jumping into a moving car is that it doesn't slow down and it keeps moving. And that's what it's like as COVID-19 spreads and scientists and medical personnel and governments are all trying to respond to create policies and design strategies for how to handle this public health emergency. We are all indeed living in a very, very unique time. The first public health emergency in the U.S. during our lifetime and what it is bringing are rapid discoveries. And every day, more and more information is being uncovered as we continue to learn more about this mysterious virus. So we must be open and shift our thinking a bit and be willing to entertain new ideas and models as they're being developed. But for those of us in the medical field, we understand that that is the very nature of research. And so in a sense, we're all kind of used to it and it's just sped up with COVID-19. So, in light of all that, one of the discoveries that recently caught my attention this week was a study that was released last Friday from Stanford University. And I want to point out that this has not yet been peer-reviewed, hence my earlier comment on the moving car. Yet, I still think it's worthy of talking about. It's the first large-scale study of its kind in the U.S. Basically, researchers conducted a study in Northern California by identifying antibodies in healthy, in healthy people to find out if they've already had contracted the SARS-CoV-2 virus and then since recovered from it. At the time that the study was done, which was in Santa Clara County, which is just outside San Francisco, had about 1,094 confirmed cases of COVID-19 and 50 people had died. But this is where it gets interesting. The actual rate of participants of the study who had antibodies was estimated by the study to be between 48,000 to 81,000 people. So when you compare that to the current U.S. coronavirus death rate of 4.1%, the Stanford Research Group, interestingly enough, shows that there was a much lower death rate of just 0.12% to 0.2%. So how do I interpret this? So I cautiously say that this is good news on two fronts, but we also need to recognize that these antibody tests have not yet necessarily been uh, uh, verified uh, uh, exactly. So we need to take this with a grain of salt. But that being said, again, cautiously, two pieces of good news. One is I think that that pushes us a little bit closer to herd immunity, which is essentially 70 to 90% of the uh, population positive for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Right now, we're not anywhere near that, and the only thing that's going to really push us over in that direction is going to be a vaccine. And number two, could it be that the virus is potentially much less deadly to the overall population than was originally thought? So I say all this, pose these questions not necessarily as conclusions, but again, as questions. And as researchers behind the study are saying, and I wholeheartedly agree, we cannot jump to conclusions or make policy choices until more research is done. All this does, however, give us something to factor in as we learn more every day about COVID-19. The next thing, uh, as I'm sure all of you who uh, uh, are talking to the press are recently uh, being talked, uh, being asked, which is questions regarding opening the country. So here we are approaching the end of April and it's natural for everyone to want to know uh, when an end date uh, or some sort of magical deadline or expiration date uh, as to when all this is going to be over. But this isn't a gallon of milk from the supermarket with a stamped expiration date. Instead, we need to look at scientific models to project potential scenarios on what's next 
when it comes to living life again without the regimented parameters that have become our norm recently. To, to that end, there was a paper from Science that I'm referencing here uh, down below that identifies viral, environmental, and immunological factors, which all together determine the dynamics of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And they integrated their findings into a mathematical model to project potential scenarios for transmission, both through the pandemic and post-pandemic periods. There's also some key uh, data used to determine which scenarios are most likely to play out to assess the duration and intensity of social distancing measures that might be needed in the coming months uh, under both existing and expanded critical care capacities. Absent other interventions and a key metric for success of social distancing is whether critical care capacities are exceeded, making prolonged or intermittent social distance may be necessary until 2022. Again, let me repeat that. Absent any interventions, uh, so prophylaxis against uh, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, or some sort of treatment, and using the success of social distancing, the measure of that success is going to be critical care capacities. So if nothing else comes around uh, uh, that prevents an overwhelming of critical care capacities and all we have is social distancing, this paper uh, out of Harvard uh, shows, uh, or through mathematical modeling, it shows that social distancing may be necessary to 2022. But I would please have you read this yourself, uh, and 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 uh, uh, and please read uh, the conclusions as to what they're saying. So, healthcare workers' voices being heard. This is the good news here. So, understandably, uh, people want to get back to work and they want to get back to living their lives the way that they're used to living them. And just as understandably, healthcare workers are afraid that opening up the country without thought will put them uh, at increased peril. And as an infectious diseases doctor, I am first to agree with America's healthcare professionals. Interestingly enough, a Pew Research study, as well as Gallup polls, are indicating that Americans are worried about their health and that social distancing uh, could potentially ramp down too quickly. So that's good news. Pew found 73% of Americans thought the worst was still to come in the coronavirus outbreak, while just 26% thought that the worst had already happened. Regardless, patience and respect are the keys to getting through this. Patience with what needs to be done and respect for those healthcare workers who are within inches of this deadly virus every day many of whom are true heroes as they put their lives on the line. So please stay on the lookout for these regular updates. And to read more from sources used in this report, go to acoi.org slash COVID-19. Together with the ACOI, we will help you have the latest information to help you respond to your patients and stay on top of this crisis. And please feel free to reach out to me anytime at m-a-d-e-r-y at mac.com. MAC.com. Please stay safe and we can do this together.